Hi, my name is Stuart Weems and welcome to the Investopoly podcast. My goal is to share easy to understand evidence-based holistic insights to help you master the game of building wealth. And as you know, I solicit questions. So if you have any feedback or questions, we'd love to hear from you. The email address is questions at investopoly.com.au. So feel free to send any feedback or questions at any time. And let's get into today's episode, which is in fact questions and answers. And the first question is from Zor. Firstly, he thanks me and gives me great feedback on the podcast. So, I mean, it's always great to receive that. Thank you so much. He's got two questions. The first one is, you recently mentioned commercial property investments in a recent Q&A session, and I'd like to know more about how it works. How is it different from investing in index funds like Vanguard? And then secondly, what's your thought on the Melbourne property market? Well, let me answer the second question first, because as I recorded a episode, episode 303 on the 8th of May, where I set out the reasons why I think Melbourne will deliver the most amount of growth in dollar value terms over the next 10 years. That's from a median price perspective. But of course, that means that, you know, if you use some asset selection principles as I talk about in the podcast, there's going to be some good returns in Melbourne, I expect, over the next 10 years. I expect over the next five years, the returns might be okay, but it still might lag other states. It's really what happens after that five-year period. I suspect we need a change of government to change the investor sentiment around property in Melbourne, but there was a survey that was released last week that interviewed or solicited feedback from 1,300 investors, and the theme from that was that generally they thought Melbourne was the best best opportunity to invest in. So maybe that investor sentiment is changing already. So there's my thoughts in the Melbourne property market. Go back and have a look on that episode on the 8th of May. If I come back to your first question, which is really around commercial property and indexing versus direct property? Well, it's a great question and one I've contemplated writing about, I still might do that. But if I'm going to answer the question today, there's a couple of concerns, I guess, around or pros and cons over direct versus indexing. First one is liquidity and scalability. So of course, if we're going to be direct property investors in commercial property, you know, it's a pretty illiquid asset. Once we decide to sell it, if there's a tenant in it, it might be okay to sell it with a tenant in it. Unlike if you're selling to residential property, most of the buyers in residential property, two thirds of them are own occupiers. So that sort of knocks them out. But with commercial property, if you think you're going to sell to an investor and there's a greater investor pool of buyers for commercial, then having a tenant is fine. But it still means once you have a campaign and go through the whole process, it could take you six months to convert it into cash. Whereas if I'm investing in Vanguard, bang, you know, I can have my money in three days, essentially, when the trade settles. Scalability. So, you know, I can invest in a Vanguard property ETF, hopefully global property ETF. I say global over a domestic one, just because the domestic tends to have sort of two much retail property exposure, whereas the global ETF tends to be more diversified. So I don't invest in the Vanguard Australia property. I invest in only Vanguard international property, but I can do that progressively, right? You know, I can put in $10,000 this year, $10,000 next, etc., etc. If I'm going to go and invest in a direct commercial property, it's a couple of million dollar exercise, which is, has its pros and cons because it forces me to invest a whole lump sum sooner and I've got the gearing, etc. But it just depends on what's going to suit you. Control is a big thing that attracts investors to direct property. You know, if I own a property, I can control what I want to do with it, who I want to rent it to, particularly commercial, because the tenancy laws are a little bit more lenient than what they are for, for residential tenancies. But I've got control over that as I can develop it, I can bequeath it, I can do whatever I want with it. Whereas I've got no control if I'm a Vanguard index fund investor. It is what it is. There's a whole bunch of different exposures in there and I'm just sort of along for the ride, if you like. Well, to generally invest in the the same asset class, although I would say a direct small commercial property in Australia versus, you know, a property index exposure that's global is substantially different. But, you know, property is really the element is we've got this asset, we've got some gearing with it, and we're enjoying an income stream. And that's sort of generally how you would describe both those different investment options. That an index will react more like an equity than direct property. So direct property is really, you know, how it's performing in terms of its value and the rental income is very factual. You know, it really depends on, okay, what have properties around the comparable properties in the area sold for? 
you know, is there a tenant in that building? How long is the lease and the options and the rent review and all those sorts of things? How many different tenants, particularly if it's, it's a multi-tenant building? You know, all those sorts of things go to its value. Whereas with an index, it's heavily impacted by expectations. And we're certainly seeing that. So there's been a bit of a lag effect. If we're looking at, say, office buildings in Australia, they've really come off in terms of value terms over last year, but that already happened with indexes, you know, a year ago because the market was already expecting that, you know, these values are going to come off. So that's kind of in recovery phase. The index is in recovery phase, whereas from a direct perspective, it's only just hitting the bottom now. And I guess that speaks to, you know, some of the reasons why people don't like equities because they can jump all over the place and expectations can influence asset values and share prices and those sorts of things. But, you know, I think in the long run, it all sort of levels out, but, you know, that's acknowledging that, that there's a difference there. And the other thing too is with commercial property is we haven't seen a recession in Australia for more than 30 years. And commercial property, unlike residential, will react more starkly to economic cycles. So I do see commercial property being marketed by different buyers, agents and investment firms and those sorts of things. I'm just concerned a little bit about the yields that are coming off these properties. You know, they're not particularly high and normally you would want, you know, a yield from a, a it depends on its location, the type of property, but normally you want a pretty high yield off a commercial property. Or let me put it differently, your starting yield will, I think, determine what your future growth might look like and your future investment returns. So I want to buy the property cheaply because if I do that, then it's likely I'm going to enjoy good future returns. Whereas if I'm kind of overpaying or paying full price for a property, you know, where is the upside? And have I factored in the fact that we haven't had a recession for more than three decades? And so something, some volatility could be around the corner. Who knows? I'm not predicting a recession, by the way, but you know, they're some of the things that I'd be thinking about. If you look at Vanguard International performance, it's just over 7% over the last 10 years, but that kind of includes the last three years, which has been pretty poor performance. A slight loss, I think it was just less than half a percent loss over the last three years. So I think if you're investing in a Vanguard International Fund, I think it's reasonable to expect somewhere between 7 to 10% compounding over the long run. And you're probably going to get 4 to 5% of that return in income, which is you know one of the reasons why people invest in property is for that sort of predictable level of income. And it was only unpredictable, obviously, during COVID lockdowns. And so I think that's pretty hard to beat, isn't it? Which is not to say, you know, I don't th see any merit in investing in commercial property. You might have heard me speak in this podcast before. I've done so personally, and I've done very well out of it. I don't hold any commercial property at the moment. But, you know, if I could go and buy something that I thought was really well located, that an I was going to get a, a seven, eight, nine percent rental yield on it. You know, I think that starts to look like value to me. But some of those properties I just described might be selling on a four or five percent rental yield. I just don't think there's enough in it to potentially justify the risk. A long-winded answer there, Zor, but it is an interesting one. I think probably one on the edge of everyone's lips. Kobe's got the next question. He's asked me about super products, you know, specifically self-managed super funds versus wraps versus industry super funds. And he's asked me or suggested, you know, it'd be great to have a very detailed sort of analysis or discussion around wrap products and when you might use them. So I won't answer it here, Kobe, because I agree with you. It's on my list. I'm going to prepare a very detailed episode specifically around super wrap platforms, especially given we use them a lot in our business. And I can say my super has been on a wrap platform for more than 20 years. And so I'll talk about, you know, what are the benefits there and, and when I might use it and so forth. Okay. My next question is from Adam. It was a real head scratcher, this one, Adam. It was good. It really made me think quite a bit about it. Adam says, here's my background. I'm 57 years old. I have over $1.9 million in super on a high income and I'm planning to work until 65, so obviously another seven years. Adam's partner is 40 years old, has 300,000 in super, high income with carried forward concessional contribution caps or unused caps, I should say, of about $40,000. My question is, am I able to max out my concessional contribution caps at $30,000 per year? And my partner maxes out her 
concessional and carry forward contribution caps, say about $45,000 a year to average them out. Now, because she's 40 and unable to touch her super until she's 60, I want to spouse split 85% of contributions, her contributions into my fund so that we can get early access to it. It also means if I died, she'd get my super and she can access the money earlier. Is this a legal move? So firstly, contribution splitting, it means that you can split your contributions with your spouse up to 85 percent of the gross contribution you made, of course, that's allowing for the 15% contribution tax. So if I put in my $30,000, I'll pay 15% in tax, and then I can move that money into my spouse's super account if I wanted to. What Adam's suggesting is that because there's a differential between ages, you know, he's 57, she's 40, 17 year difference, why not accumulate all the super into his account? And that way it maximizes the flexibility because they can access that obviously in, well, seven years when he plans to retire, but even potentially earlier than that, he can access it in 60, so in three years. So you're locking away for a much shorter period of time. Now, Adam's already reached the transfer balance cap of $1.9 million. That's the most amount you can have in pension phase and not pay any tax, which will therefore mean if he moves those, well, works another seven years, gets another seven years of growth, another seven years of contributions. And then if he also receives his spouse's contributions as well, well, he's going to be well over that transfer balance cap limit which means that he could convert the transfer balance cap into pension. So let's talk in today's numbers. That's 1.9. And then whatever's left over, he can either leave in accumulation. It's going to be taxed at 15% and 10% for capital gains. Or he can take that money out tax-free and get complete access to it. Now, here's the kicker that I thought of. What Adam could do is he could do the spousal contribution splitting. And then when he reaches 65, he then goes into retirement. What he could then do is take those contributions out again maybe $100,000 a year or something like that, whatever is going to maintain you know, it under the non-concessional cap. And then his spouse, if she wants to, can re-contribute those contributions into her account. The benefit of that is that she changes what would otherwise be a taxable component of a super to being tax-free because it's come back into super via a non-concessional contribution. So the strategy is pretty good. I like it, Adam, and it's certainly legal. You know, you can certainly make the maximum concessional contributions over the next few years. That's going to give you a lot of income tax benefits. You can then contribution split so that you've got access to those monies a lot sooner than, you know, if part of those contributions were in your spouse's account. And then you could turn your mind to, after in seven years time after you retire, you can turn your mind into potentially moving some of those monies that are in your super back into hers, whether you do that now or, you know, maybe another 10 years or whatever it might be, something closer to uh, retirement. By doing that, by doing that re-contribution strategy, you're actually going to change the tax nature of your balance, which isn't going to change the amount of tax that you might pay if you leave your super to a beneficiary, so to each other. But if you've got other beneficiaries like children or whatever it might be, it'll minimize the amount of tax the estate actually has to pay on the super balance by doing that. So great idea, Adam. And that's why I said it was a bit of a a head scratcher because that's something I hadn't thought of or come across before. Okay, next question is from Nathan. Nathan writes, on the 6th of August, the podcast case study episode outlined a couple who purchased two residential properties and a commercial property in investment trust. Can you outline why the couple has chosen the trust for the residential properties and commercial properties? What are some of the things you might think about when choosing trust versus personal name other than structure? It's a great question, Nathan. Actually, going back to that podcast episode, there was one inside super, one inside a trust. Those are two residential. And then certainly the commercial was inside the trust. I don't know why those properties were structured in the trust. It was done more than 15 years ago. I'm not even sure, you know, whether we were involved in that advice. I don't think we were, well, we wouldn't have been the tax accountant for that client at that time. So that could be just a legacy decision. Certainly it was fine from them from a negative gearing perspective because the husband was self-employed and he could distribute business income into that trust to soak up the negative gearing aspect. So that would be the first thing to think about, you know, any losses are trapped inside a trust. So certainly POIG individuals doesn't make a lot of sense to put it in a trust because you're trapping the negative gearing. And then 
negative gearing income tax benefits are quite valuable. You know, we want a tax saving today versus waiting for a tax saving in the future. But certainly a trust is negative from a land tax perspective. So that is they'll pay more land tax having in a trust versus personal names. I think so if I switch the question around, Nathan, and say, under what circumstances would I buy property in a trust? Well, I'd have to be convinced that their income tax savings and or capital gains tax savings would be worth more than what I might pay in additional land tax. And I guess the only time that might occur, or at least the time that I can think of that that might occur, is where we've got a short holding period. And that could be because we're developing the property and then we're going to sell it. And therefore, we want to have the flexibility to, say, distribute the capital gain as a result of selling that property to many different beneficiaries that may be known at this stage or not even identified yet. And so having a trust gives us that flexibility. But if it's a buy and hold, so I'm going to go and buy this property, be it commercial or residential, I'm going to hold it for a very long period of time. Typically, I would avoid putting that property in a trust mostly because of land tax and then depending on you know, whether I'm going to get the negative gearing benefits as well. But great question, Nathan. Great pickup. Maybe something I should have mentioned in that actual episode. Okay, next question is from Chelsea. A really good question. I've got a question about financial priorities during maternity leave. We're a couple from Melbourne expecting our first baby in December. My husband has a salary and I'm a sole trader, so we need to fund maternity leave from our own savings for around about 18 months before I return to full-time work. During this time, I will not be able to save and will have limited cash flow. We have a mortgage on an apartment which we live in and we have been building savings in an offset account so we can sell an upgrade to a better property and that's our key financial goal. I'm wondering if I should sit tight on our deposit and leave it completely in the offset as upgrading our home is still our priority or put a portion of our savings to a different use over this period of time and then rebuild the deposit once I'm earning again. And Chelsea mentions things like contribute to super, invest in shares, those sorts of things. For your information, I have more super than my husband at the moment. So we're not thinking about him covering my super over that time. It's a really great question, Chelsea. I think I've mentioned before in some podcasts that, you know, trying to build wealth while also starting a family is incredibly difficult because obviously your income is unusually lower and your expenses tends to be unusually higher as well. Although when you've got a young family, you don't tend to go out very much. So at least there's a, a saving on that particular side of the coin as well. The best way to answer this question is to ask yourself, what is your time horizon? What's the investment time horizon here we're talking about? And what's the consequences associated with a negative return? So your time horizon is really one and a half to two years. Let's call it sort of that. We'll put a circle around that sort of time. So it's relatively short. If you lose your deposit monies, the consequence is a delay in being able to upgrade your home. Now, if that's only if that delay is only a couple of months, not a big deal. But if that delay is a couple of years, there could be a substantial cost associated with that, if, particularly if property in Melbourne starts to move. And when it does start to move, it'll tend to move relatively quickly. So it's really clear to me that if I was in your position, I would do absolutely nothing. I'd leave that money in the offset account. We're only talking about one and a half years. You're looking at upgrading in Melbourne. I don't think Melbourne's going to do much over the next one to two years. So it could actually be perfect timing. By the time you get back to work, you've recovered your income and therefore cash flow and consequently borrowing capacity. And then hopefully by that time, also interest rates are a little bit lower, which obviously will even improve your borrowing capacity further. And then I would go and put that deposit to use and execute on that upgrade and buy the high highest quality asset that you could buy. As I said, if you lose some of that money in the offset account, it'll push that timeline out even further. And then that, that's where I think you're getting into the risky part of the potential distribution of returns in Melbourne. So as I keep saying, I think next couple of years might be quiet, but if I'm thinking about three, four, five years from now, the closer we get to so that five-year period, the higher the risk is that the market continues to move. And the flip side to that also would be, okay, well, if we do take some of that money out and we do put it to a different use, what can we conceivably earn as a return? And how, is that really going to change our life very much? And I'm not being flagrant. Of course, any improvement in our financial position is positive, but it's not necessarily going to push you into a different price point. You know, it's not really going to change your life very much. Whereas if you put that money into the market and the market dropped by 50%, you know, I think you'll look back in a year and a half time and regret doing that. And I think just as an aside, I certainly wouldn't be putting it in super. You know, if you're young and you're starting a family, you've got plenty of runway 
left to think about super, you know, I would be keeping that money outside super. And as you said, number one goal is to upgrade that home. I'd be putting all my financial resources towards executing on that goal. Okay, next question is, I'm going to call him B because he didn't want me to use his first name. So B writes, I have a question about employee shares. In your earlier episodes, you talked about the approach of strategically divesting of employee shares, which might be acquired as a part of remuneration. I understand your thinking behind this relates to not having all your eggs in one basket in terms of investing in the same industry and company that you are both employed and therefore also then investing in. I'm working for a fairly large Australian employee-owned professional services firm, which offers some employees the opportunity to purchase equity in the company. The company is well-established and diversified in that it is exposed to multiple industries and geographical markets, especially across Australia, North America and the UK. The performance of the shares over the last 15 years has been strong, both in terms of capital growth and dividends much higher than what you might get from ETFs. And the shares can be purchased incrementally over time, subject to supply and demand, but can only be traded once a year on a particular date. I'd love to hear your thoughts on how you might advise clients on purchasing or not purchasing the equity in their companies where they're employed, considering the potential opportunity cost of not taking up the offer. I mean, it's a great question, B. You know, of course, there's a couple of risks here. There's a concentration risk, which you've sort of identified. You know, if we go to, you know, put a lot of wealth in this company that is also generating your income, and for whatever reason, maybe because of something that's unsystematic, like poor management or poor strategy or poor execution, you know, the company suffers. And therefore, then, you know, that might put some questions around your job security, and then also your investment isn't going to work. So there's your concentration risk. Then there's also a liquidity risk as well. I mean, you say you can trade these shares once a year, but if we do have poor performance, the company's not doing well. I wonder whether there's the depth of market still in that in order to be able to get your money out if that's what you want to do at that time. Of course, you're always going to find a buyer when things are going well, but it's when things aren't going so well that we need to really think carefully about. I think the way that I'd approach this opportunity is I would describe it as sort of core satellite. So I'd still want to have have a core investment strategy that didn't involve or have any linkage towards investing in this unlisted business that you're employed by. And I'd want to make pretty significant inroads to implementing on that core strategy before I started to consider investing any material amounts in that company. So I'm not saying nothing but I'm talking about material amounts. So, I mean, I don't know your circumstances, income, assets, all those sorts of things, but you you might decide, oh, look, I'll buy two or three or $4,000 of this stock each year over the next couple of years. But, you know, most of my financial resources are going to go towards my core strategy. And your core strategy could be, you know, investing in property, investing in shares, additional super contributions, you know, all the sort of stuff that I talked about. Then once you felt like your core strategy was kind of bedded down or well on the road to being bedded down, then you could turn some of your attention towards increasing the amount that you invest in this company. And the way that I'm thinking about it is that I will still want the strategy to work even if the company blew up. So even if your stock went to zero because it didn't really work out, you know, you're still on the track to achieving your financial and lifestyle goals. And as a general approach, I wouldn't feel so comfortable if the exposure that we had to that company was more than 20% of your investment assets. So your investment assets is going to be equity and investment properties, share portfolio, superannuation, cash savings, these sorts of things, sort of excluding the family home, if you like, and any anything in the offset account against your home loan. If it did go over 20%, the only way I'd have an appetite for that is if the remaining investment assets were still enough to fund retirement. So if you had $4 million of investment assets and that was enough to fund your goals, and then you ended up having $2 million in this company, you know, I'm prepared to take that risk because I know that I've always got something to fall back. On. So that's a general approach I would take. And it's difficult to say, of course, and nothing in these podcasts, uh, specific advice as I've mentioned before, but that would be my general sort of response to a question like that. But of course, I don't know your circumstances, so it's entirely possible I might take a different approach. Okay, I reckon we can squeeze in one more quick question from Hayden. Hayden writes, my partner and I currently have one rental property and looking to purchase another. We're now late 20s, living back home to try and get ahead. Well done, Hayden. That's great. My question is to do with the first homeowner's grant. 
When we bought our first home, it was bought in my partner's name due to my credit score and casual status at work. I'm now on the mortgage, but still not on the title of the house. Would I still be eligible for the first homeowner's grant or any other schemes as I've technically haven't purchased a property in my name? You'll have to have a look at the state revenue office in the state that you're in. So I would just Google SRO New South Wales or SRO Victoria or you know wherever you are. And all the states have of these eligibility checklists on their website and forms that you can go through to sort of check on those sorts of things. And they're all going to be different because these uh, tend to be state-based administered, administered grants and stamp duty exemptions and all those sorts of things. But just generally, most of them exclude your eligibility if your spouse or partner, de facto married, whatever it might be, has previously owned a property before. And because you're on the mortgage, it would be easy for the state revenue office to argue that you have a beneficial interest in that property, because that's the only way a bank can add you to the mortgage is if they believe there's a financial interest there. They've obviously then assessed you as either married or de facto, and that's probably what's going to rule you out from getting a first time owner's grant. But check it out on the state revenue office in your state. Okay, I think that's enough Q&A for today. Thank you so much for all the really great questions. They're a lot of thought provoking and really helpful. So if you have any feedback or questions or anything like that, investopoly.com.au. And of course, just a favor, if you do enjoy the podcast, please share it, get it out there, suggest a friend or a family member or whoever else might benefit from it. The more, the merrier, of course. And that'd be a great favor to myself. So thank you so much. And until tomorrow, bye for now.